You are listening to Bishop Sheen Presents here on the Bishop Sheen Today Media Network. I'm your host, Al Smith, and today I have a very spe special guest with me, uh, Father Dave Tomasicki. Uh, he is a priest uh, from the Archdiocese of Detroit, and he has compiled and edited an excellent book of Sheen's writings on the demonic. And uh, we've been sharing with you over the last five weeks uh, a number of audio recordings of Archbishop Sheen's talks on the demonic. And uh, so uh, we're ready now to uh, meet the teacher, uh, but today's teacher, because um, again, Fulton Sheen wrote these things many years ago, uh, but every so often we have good spiritual sons that come forward uh, to uh, present, or I should say represent Sheen's works, and we have Father Dave with us today. And so, uh, Father Dave Tomasicki, welcome to Bishop Sheen Presents. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Great to see you again. Yes, Father, we have you in our presence, so we'd ask you to begin our broadcast in prayer, if you could, please. Oh, definitely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into our presence. Please come down and be with us, and guide and guard our conversation, that we may always seek you. Please send us your Son, his holy name, his precious blood, our Blessed Mother, to guide us. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, again, the book is on the demonic. And, um, you know, when it comes to Sheen's literature and what's available today, uh, many of us know some of the classic Sheen titles. We uh, we hear we've been told, oh, you need to lead, read Life of Christ. Um, you know, Sheen's a beautiful, I want to say, Lexio Divina on um, our Lord. Uh, you need to purchase and read The World's First Love, uh, Sheen's Holy Hour prayer book. And I'm sure that you, in your years of study, started to realize uh, there's no book on the demonic. And so uh, you saw the need and responded to it. To that. So uh, please kind of uh, take us on that journey of how you came about to compile and edit this book of Sheen's writings on the demonic. So yeah, so when, when I was in the beginning, just, just getting into Sheen, I didn't realize there wasn't a book on the demonic. So, so early in my reading of him, I picked up the book, Those Mysterious Priests, which is his second book on the priesthood, an excellent book, came out in 1974. It is the last book published in his lifetime. He, uh, his, his autobiography came out the year after he died. So I was reading this book, Those Mysterious Priests, and I came upon this line that uh, he says about, about a paragraph, really, on the demonic and says, the demonic I shall treat in another book. And at the time, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I look forward to reading that book. And I kind of forgot about that. And then a few years later, in 2016, I was searching for a thesis topic. And I, I, I love Sheen. I'm very familiar with him. I wanted to find some kind of topic that, that, that Sheen writes about and, and expand on that, delve into that discover that. So I was, I was reading through those mysterious priests again, and I noticed the line again, like, hmm, the demonic I shall treat in another book. And by this time I knew like that book does not exist, but he intended to write a book. And he said that five years before he died, she never stopped. He was go, go, go. Even, you know, 1977, 1979, when he's having heart issues and whatnot, he just, he just never stopped. I'm like, there's got to be a book just sitting there in his archives waiting to be published, I was hoping. So I uh, I actually pursued a different subject for my thesis topic. So I, I didn't, I kind of set that down and I was a little bit scared to look for it. Like, hmm, the demonic, that's, that's dangerous. Got to be careful here. So in 2020, during the, the lockdown, a publishing company, Emmaus Road, they, they called me, they wanted to publish my thesis. And I actually, I actually kind of countered like, well, you know, what if... I have this other idea. You know, what if I go try to find this long lost book? He said he's going to write a book on the demonic. I kind of suspect there's one out there. What if I go try to find it? Well, they love that idea. So I started searching and I it, it took a bit. It took a bit of figuring out like, you know, who's who, who knows what, what archives are where, who has what. But as I delved into it, it's like, okay, I don't think this book exists. Um, and it's actually, it, it's possible that it did exist and it got lost somewhere. That's, I, I don't think that's what happened, but that's possible. Okay. So, but as I delve through, I noticed like, man, he says a lot about the demonic, 
particularly the last dozen years of his life, and, and really particularly from 1969 to 1974. There's a real concentration on the demonic, and even building up to 1969, he keeps pointing out like, hey, we're coming into a demonic time. And by the early 70s, he's saying, we are in a demonic time. So I, I went through and I saw all this stuff on the demonic. It's like, man, like Fulton Sheen, he intended to write a book. There's all this material just sitting here. Like, I need to put this together. And the trick was, it wasn't just sitting there. It was, it was, it was all over the place. It was tough to find it all. Um, but I, I spent many hours diving deep into his archives, into his, his newspaper articles, deep online searches, his, his talks and whatnot. But I think I got it all. So the book is all in Fulton Sheen's words. It's it's everything he says about the demonic, not my words, but his words. Right. And you've put it in um, what I call um, uh, a teachable book in the sense that you could sit back uh, with some friends and even family members and go through a beautiful study of the demonic. And, um, you know, anyone that's involved with spiritual warfare, they know, uh, they, they say to us, know your enemy. And when I read my Bible and I look at uh, our blessed Lord, uh, he comes out of the desert and who greets him is the devil. Um, and I think, you know, we can almost say every time we step out of the church, um, who's greeting us, of course, the world, the flesh, and the devil. and But yet we need to know our enemies, know his tricks. And I think this is what Fulton Sheen does so beautifully. And the way you've laid out this, uh, uh, you know, this presentation in your book is that you introduce us to the devil. Um, and you talk about the, you know, the essence of the demonic and the beginning of the book, but you also, uh, you know, give this idea of like in the beginning, <laughs> you know, let's go back to the beginning. Um, and maybe we could start there of uh, how uh, Sheen wants to introduce us to the demonic. Uh, but again, there's that, um, you know, idea that we acknowledge who Satan is. So uh, I'll let you begin with that. So it's interesting. You point out like how well the book has been laid out. And that was not my intention. My, so so honestly, my intention was not to make some nice readable book. My intention was more of a scholarly thing. Like let's, let's find everything he says, put it in the book form. That was my main intention. But as I went through things, just uh, they laid out very well, which is to me, one of the evidences that he was indeed working on a book. He was getting his thoughts in line. And that's why they do line up so well. So yes, uh, it starts with, uh, I used to call it the overture, but it's, it's the introduction. Um, just just a, a brief little bit from some talks that Fulton Sheen gave on the essence of the demonic. And then there is the, uh, uh, pardon me, the preface is that. And then the introduction is the essence of the demonic. It's pulled from a number of talks from the 70s. And it really introduces you to see just the, the bare bones, like, okay, what is it? What's going on? And he touches upon the three signs, which we get to later. He touches upon the three weapons, which again, we get to later. But then, yes, the first chapter is in the beginning. And it's it's actually, it's just a chapter that I pulled from the uh, the Curio Journal, the, the Rochester Diocesan paper that Fulton Sheen, when he was the, the, the Bishop of Rochester, which is kind of funny, like, like, uh, you know, Catholic papers, they have a hard time, they don't make money. And, you know, they're authors, like, they just everyone's kind of working for free or for cheap. Could you imagine having Fulton Sheen as your author for your paper? Like, not bad. So, especially in 1969, which is his last year there, he really starts writing about the demonic. And uh, the very first chapter, you know, in the beginning, the anti-creativity of Satan. Uh, it, it's it's the chapter that appeared on January 17th, 1969, and was originally called, Does the Moon's Ugliness Reflect the Anti-Creativity of Satan? So in 1969, they hadn't landed on the moon yet, but they were working their way toward that. Space program was in, was in full swing. And he gives a he gives a nice reflection about like yeah why is why is uh, the moon just you know an empty void and it goes back to the first two verses of Genesis where where you know God creates and then there's this empty void of chaos that he has to like pull together it's like hmm that doesn't sound like how God creates exactly you know so he suspects God created and then the angels fell Satan fell and everything and that's what. Uh, uh, everything fell down at that time. And then 
our Lord has to has to draw order out of it. So it, it just it's a very interesting thought, and it's not strictly you know the church doesn't say yes this is exactly how it happened but it doesn't say it didn't happen that way either so it's it's kind of speculative theology but he does in that get into the nature of satan the anti-creativity of satan and uh you know how, how he destroys things how he he's he's a parasite he's a leech he's a lot of things but he doesn't have his own so he has to destroy yours and then uh, we can get into a lot of the, the implications there too. You know, abortion, birth control, these things, these things that are anti-creativity. It's it's from Satan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is where we begin. Is we have to acknowledge that Satan exists. Um, again, his whole mission was to just fly under the radar. Um, you know, again, one of his greatest. Um, um, I don't want to give him too many credits, you know, I don't want to give the devil credit, but his, 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 one of his greatest victories is that we don't believe in him. And you hear people say, I don't believe there's a devil. It's, that's just an imagination. That's, you know, that's just, you guys are just trying to manipulate us and control us. So, um, but Fulton Sheen was a good, the good priest, the good bishop saying, no, 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 we, he exists. And again, he would always open up the Bible and he'd give those, um, you know, he'd cite passages from scripture to kind of prove his position, uh, yeah. to get us to believe. And he was so good at that. And, you know, in the book, Life of Christ, which you cite, um, again, one of the chapters, the short cross, it was the shortcut to the cross. And, um, you know, again, the devil met him as he exited the desert and offered him a number of shortcuts uh, because he knew um, he was the Lord and um, the, the battle was on. And yet, again, when I look at scripture, I see so many times um, the demons cry out. They say, you know, Jesus, son of God, you've come to torment us. Like, you know, and, and so, you could, so you see the battle is real. And, and I say that to our listeners, that uh, please do not, uh, you know, go any further saying that he doesn't exist or, you know, I don't have to worry about the devil. Yes, you do, because, again, he's out to destroy. Uh, Fulton Sheen so poetically wrote in 1949 in his book, Peace of Soul, unless souls are saved, nothing is saved. And this is all about saving souls. And this is what Fulton Sheen did week in and week out with his newspaper columns, his radio addresses, his television shows. He was trying to save souls and rescue us from the devil. And so uh, this is a rescue book, I like to say. Uh, you know, I've got different, uh, you know, slogans I want to attach to this book. Uh, but again, it is a book on the demonic and it's available through the St. Paul Center, uh, again, Emmaus, uh, uh, Emmaus Press Publishing. Um, again, I had mentioned the book is available through that little bookstore called Amazon. Uh, of course, our listening audience in Australia, the Philippines, England, Ireland, United States, and Canada, you all have access to Amazon, and the book is there. Uh, but again, the St. Paul Center is, I believe it's uh, stpaulcenter.com. Um, and that'll get you to the St. Paul Center where they have great resources, not just the, the book on the demonic by Sheen, but titles by Dr. Scott Hahn and so many other great theologians. So uh, again, glad to have St. Paul uh, in their ministry uh, partnering with us here at Bishop Sheen Presents. Uh, we mentioned, I, I mentioned the Life of Christ book, and I'm sure, Father, you have read that book uh, many times. Numerous times, and, yes. Numerous times. And again, tell us, a little bit, um, again, I'm just segueing back, um, you know, to talk about your priesthood and Sheen's effect on you. And because um, our listeners are are starting to uh, come around um, to see that, wow, what Sheen wrote in the 30s, 40s and 50s, it's it's for 2024. It's for the times we're living in today. And so uh, maybe share some Sheen moments in, in your childhood or your um you know, your studies of his seminary. And because I think this is what is beautiful. We share our own Sheen stories. Uh, and then people, of course, say, I want to learn more. So I'll leave you, I'll, I'll let you share some of your Sheen moments over the years. Oh, yeah, definitely. So a couple couple comments on, on, on your comments, though. So uh, to our listeners outside of the U.S. and Canada, um, so far you can't get the book yet, but we're working on that. We're working on that. 
So uh, there's been, I think, five publishers from outside the U.S. who have reached out to us for publishing rights. And sadly, it's not quite that simple because um, I have parts of Life of Christ, which the, the copyright's held by someone else. So we got to negotiate with them and they give us permission to give permission to you. So uh, there's a company in India that we just got permission to. There's a company in Australia that's reached out to us and we're working on that. There's a company in Germany and Poland and Croatia who've all reached out. So it, it's not quite available worldwide yet, but we're almost there. We're working on it. Hopefully it'll be available very, very soon. And then, you know, you, you mentioned about uh, people who don't believe in the devil, people, oh, I, I can't be true. And, and Fulton Sheen talks a lot about it, but I find it very interesting. And this is, this is one of my newer thoughts. I mean, it's, it's in Fulton Sheen's book, but I didn't, I didn't catch it till later. So C.S. Lewis talks about how, you know, there's two equal and opposite errors. And the one error is to, to disbelieve in the devil. Oh, it doesn't, ha it's not true. You know, the other error is to be too overly fascinated in him. Okay. Those are both extremes and errors. But recently I've been figuring out, and again, Fulton Sheen even says so, you can fall into both errors at the same time. You know, many, many people are fascinated by, oh, exorcisms, the demonic, oh, that's so cool. But they don't actually believe in it. So, oh, so you don't believe and you're overly fascinated? So Fulton Sheen has a line that as we treat the devil as a myth, he works on us as a reality. So it's it's in the book. Anyways, okay, to get to your question. So yes, um, I became a big Fulton Sheen fan in 2009. A priest lent me the book Life of Christ. At the time, I was at Ave Maria University discerning the priesthood. I was actually... <laughs> I was actually trying to discern that the priesthood was not for me. I didn't want to be a priest, you know. So this, this priest gives me life of Christ, and I wanted to not like it. Everyone else likes Fulton Sheen. My dad likes Fulton Sheen. I, just, I, I don't want to be part of the crowd. I don't want to like him. And I read the book, and it blew me away, like absolutely blew me away. It's his best book. Few would say otherwise. Mother Teresa. So, 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 you know, many saints have written a life of Christ. Mother Teresa's favorite was Fulton Sheen's. I mean, that tells you something. So after reading that, I just couldn't get enough of him. And I just, I just everything I could find, I would read. And I remember I read like, you know, seven of his books very quickly at one point. And I even started to think like, oh, I, I just, boy, I'm reading too much Sheen. I need to read some other people. So I did. I started reading other people and, and you know, they were, they were good. And my spiritual director noticed like something like there's like a lack in my spiritual life. Like what, what's going on? What changed? I'm like, well, I thought I was reading too much Sheen. So I stopped. It's like, no, like, dude, he's doing it for you, you know? And I kind of look at it like a band, like many people have their favorite band or all oh, this band. I just, I just never get tired of them. They just, they just do it for me. Um, Fulton Sheen doesn't do it for everyone, but he does it for me and he does it for a lot of people. It is uh, before we started recording the interview, you know, you're talking about just at the seminaries and whatnot. And it's amazing how many seminarians cite Fulton Sheen as, as part of their path, you know, and, and inspiration toward the priesthood. And that was definitely true for me. I mean, more directly, it was me making my holy hours in front of our Lord that really, where I really discovered my vocation. But like, how did I get to know the Lord? Life of Christ was a big help. Just doing the holy hour was everything. Well, Fulton Sheen's a huge fan of the holy hour. He really pushes that. So, so Fulton Sheen, he directly affected me. He indirectly affected me. Um, I, you know, I have a line, I hate to just like cite my own line, but at the very, very, very back of the book in the acknowledgments, I have a whole bunch of acknowledge, acknowledgments, and I say, last but not least, thank you to the venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Your teachings and wisdom are forming a whole new generation of priests. You passed from this earthly life before I was born, but I'm hoping to meet you one day in heaven. God love you, Fulton Sheen. And like I, I mean that in all sincerity, but it's like it's not just me. Like he, he's forming a whole new generation of priests. And it's it's very beautiful, and you just see you see the love of Christ that he had, and the way he's able to share that, and the way it was able to bear fruit. So yes, I hope that answers your question at least to an extent. But he's he's had a big effect of me before seminary, during seminary, and after seminary too. And even so, before seminary, I read his book. Those uh, I read the book, uh, the priest is not his own. His first book on the priesthood. And I read that like, okay, that's, that's a fine book. You know, not amazing, but it's a fine book. 
And then I read it six months into priesthood. I'm like, man, this is an excellent book. You know, now that I am a priest and I'm reading it, okay, this makes way more sense. This is a great book. He just, he really does it for me. Yeah. And this is why I say to people is that we we have to minister to our seminarians. Uh, I've been blessed in that for almost 15 years now, I've been visiting seminarians and giving them Fulton Sheen's books and uh, planting some seeds, so to speak. Uh, but so many of them speak well of Sheen's book, The Priest is Not His Own. And I think we're... Um, many young men are attracted to the priesthood after reading Sheen's book is they see that they're called to be both priest and victim and to offer their lives for something uh, and for someone. And of course, um, it's this idea of sacrifice. And yeah. it's just not a vocation of, oh, I'm going to be a social worker, uh, you know, great counselor. Um, yeah, you do a lot of that as priest, but you become priest and victim. And I think that's where uh, I, I say to our listeners, don't abandon the seminarians. Visit yeah, with them. Yeah. Give them Fulton Sheen. Um, give them the book on the demonic. Um, again, give them Life of Christ because uh, you're sending them a lifeline. They then, because they have time to read and to meditate. And uh, again, I, I just plead with our plead with our audience to uh, take um, you know take to uh, serious thought, praying for priests, praying for seminarians but visiting with them and giving them these great resources, if you can, uh, again, so, so important. Fulton Sheen is at his best when talking about the cross. Like, I don't know anyone who puts together priest and victim better than he does, better than he explains it. Other, many others have, but I, better than him, I don't know. He, he does it so well. And young men are attracted to that. And honestly, men are attracted to that. And women are too, in, in their own way. But men, especially young men, are attracted to that, that ideal of, okay, priest and victim. I, I want to spend myself. I want something worthy of spending myself. You know, I want to find that and do that and, and hear God's call. So, so as an ideal, it's great. And it's great in seminary to meditate on that and pray about that. And then <laughs> when you become a priest, you get ordained and you're in a parish, oh, it comes true. Um, the people will kill you. So I'm, I'm at a parish right now. I help out at a parish. And the last four pastors, two of them have had heart attacks, you know. And when uh, I remember when I was a new priest, my, my priest mentor telling me like, hey, the people will kill you. And then at your at your funeral, they go, oh, he should have just said no. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work that way. So I remember when I was in my first assignment after two years, I, I got really burned out and I started putting up boundaries. And I, 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 was, I was trying to put up these boundaries so that I wouldn't ever get burned out again. And then there's a certain thought in my mind, like, I mean, man, these people are going to kill me. I mean, let's, let's look at Jesus. They didn't let him, he didn't let them kill him. Well, actually, hold on. Yes, he did. Um, so, so like, yeah, you don't just die for anything. You don't die on any hill. But yeah, it's priest and victim. And the people should eat you up. There's something very Eucharistic that our Lord is the priest and he's the lamb who's offered. Priest and lamb, priest and victim. There's something very Eucharistic about it when we spend ourselves. But yes, it's been, it was inspiring to me when I was in seminary. And then as a priest, it's been very helpful because boy, is it true. Yeah. You know, we, we talk about the Eucharist and, um, you know, I think of Sheen's love for Eucharistic adoration and his uh, desire to spend one hour in prayer every day, uh, a promise he made or a commitment he made when he was a seminarian uh, to give that hour to God every day, to converse with him, to encounter him face to face. And I know in the book uh, on the demonic, you spend some time talking about the holy hour as, of course, um, our greatest way to fight the demonic. And um, to our listeners, uh, Ken, many of you are uh, adorers. Many of you go to uh, your local churches or your adoration chapels and spend time with the Lord. Uh, but Fulton Sheen was encouraging the homebound and those who can't get to a church to still carve out that hour each day, um, make a spiritual communion, but be with the Lord, have your Bibles, have your holy books, 
but be with the Lord and listen to him. Um, again, you, this chapter about fighting the demonic with the holy hour, let's talk a little bit about that because uh, I think it's uh, people are asking, give me some solutions, some strategies. Um, and we'll talk about some more strategies as we continue the interview, but uh, the holy hour, it's, um, I know for myself, it's my best-selling book, um, the holy hour prayer book that Sheen uh, put together in the 40s and offered to his listeners, uh, especially during the war years. He was saying, we'll do our part and pray for the soldiers and pray for victory, but you do your part and spend time with the Lord. But again, this preaching on the holy hour, I think, Father, you've said in many of your reflections that um, in the early years of Sheen's priesthood, uh, he would give uh, retreats and and recommend the Holy Hour uh, to um, you know people attending his retreats. But by the time it was the 1960s and 1970s, he was saying, you must make a Holy Hour. It's not optional. But uh, uh, enlighten us a little bit about the Holy Hour and, uh, again, how we can use the Holy Hour to fight the demonic. Okay, yeah. So so he gives three signs of the demonic, and then he gives other signs, too. And then he gives three weapons against the demonic, and then he gives other weapons, too. So his three main weapons, as you go through them and say, okay, okay, they're beautiful chapters, lovely, but what do I do, you know? So the last chapter is, uh, it's pulled from uh, four or five talks he gave, um, four or five audio recordings of talks he gave on the demonic, uh, fighting the demonic with the holy hour, and then some handwritten notes that I found also. But yeah, so 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 the most, I think, the most concrete things he gives us, the most concrete weapon is the holy hour. And as you were saying, like beginning of his life, beginning of his priesthood, he was making the holy hour. He was recommending it. This is a good thing. By the end, he's saying, hey, you guys need to do a holy hour. And he attached it, he he. he more and more saw it in the Bible, just, you know, the the uh, hour, how it's used by John in the Bible. So he's saying, hey, this is biblical. And then by the 70s, with the increase of the demonic, like, hey, we we need to be more prayerful than we used to. You know, maybe, maybe you didn't have to do a holy hour back in the 1920s. Well, in the 1970s, you do, you know. So uh, so it, it's a very, very practical. He lays out three main reasons for it. There's other ones too, but three main reasons. The first is continuity of prayer. And, and he says, like, we're just, we're so scatterbrained. I mean, TV, not, the non sequitur, uh, psychedelic images, they just, they just ruin our reason. And we just, we can't collect ourselves. We can't pray in 10 or 20 minutes. And it's interesting and kind of scary. He was saying these things 55 years ago. Like, I heard a couple of years ago that the average adult has a attention span of eight seconds and the average goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. Like we're worse than goldfish now. Mm -hmm. So just practically, just to get our thoughts together, we need a holy hour. And then the second reason he says is intercession. And it's a very, very beautiful session, uh, section. And it's it's interesting. He talks about like, oh, ministry. Ministry, it's just a lightweight word. What does it mean? What are we doing? Well, we're saving. We're making reparation. We're interceding. And he talks about when Moses came down from the mountain and Aaron and the people that made the golden calf and they were going crazy. And uh, and and and. Moses goes back to God and he, God, God offers to blot them out, you know, and man, the, the world's lucky I wasn't Moses because I would have said, you know what, that makes a lot of sense, God. Finally, we're getting somewhere. That's not what Moses says. He says, you know, blot me out if you will, but save these people. He interceded for the people. And uh, in our individualistic culture, I don't think we realize how much influence we have, especially spiritual influence. Nowadays, man, nowadays people try so hard with their political influence. And, oh, if I just argue via Facebook, I'll change your mind. It's just, it's just ridiculous. We have so little influence there. Um, our main influence is in the spiritual realm, and we got to get back to praying and really interceding for others. And then the third reason, the main reason, is the Lord asked for it. Will you not watch one hour with me. And then in this section, he lays out what hour means in the Gospel of John. God has his day, the devil has his hour, but then our Lord's request for that hour is to counteract the demonic hour. So we have the holy hour, and that's that's really when the rubber hits the road for uh, fighting Satan. He talks about the, the openness of Satanism, the increase of the demonic, and how we, uh, you know, the, the devil believes. The devil believes in the Eucharist. He doesn't worship, he doesn't love, but he believes. Okay, we got to believe, and we have to love. 
and even even the stuff honestly it goes back to it goes back to the olympics and the the mockery of the last supper you know and people oh if i you know I'll write this letter i'll call this number and this, yeah. good luck with that i don't think a letter is going to change the devil's mind you know but if the if if the if the uh the devil hates like we have to love our lord if the devil mocks the eucharist we have to worship the eucharist that's how you really counteract these things that's how you really fight right and it's this call for reparation it's um as you said we just if we think we can just write a letter or you know do a facebook post no uh, we need to get on our knees and we need to invite others to get on their knees too. Um, you know, when the blasphemies were taking place at the Paris Olympics, uh, people would say, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to um, kneel before the uh, the image of the veil of Veronica uh, at home. And uh, again, they just uh, mocked our Lord. Well, I want to spend some time uh, consoling the Lord praying for the conversion of these sinners, uh, but say to them, this is what I'm doing. Do you want to come join me? Um, yeah. And this is the idea is that we need to build these armies, these troops of people that are praying, making reparation, um, counteracting the evil. And, uh, you know, that's the important thing is to say, we just can't idly just say, uh, it'll take care of itself. No, we have to engage the enemy and uh, what Jesus did, he pursued the devil. He came to defeat the devil. Like it's okay to go on the offensive, and I think sometimes this is what we get um, duped into believing. Like, oh, we're we're on the defensive. Oh, you know, we we cower, but yet our Lord's saying, no, no, no. You were made for offense. You were made for offense. Go out and um, again slay some dragons um, if you want. You know. Um... And that's the key, is that we need to do our part. Uh, many who have listened know that we have a great love for the uh, Holy Face devotion. And again, that devotion is one of, uh, again, being the pursuer. Um, you know, arise, O Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. Let those that hate thee flee before your face. We're coming for you. And um, again, that passage from Scripture, St. Athanasius said, that uh, they were asking the demons, what uh, scripture passages do you fear the most? And they quoted that scripture. Again, arise, O Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. Let those that hate thee flee before thy face. But again, we were made for offense, not defense. Well, it's, um, I mean, in the Gospel of Matthew, you know, uh, Matthew 16, 18, and, you know, you're, uh, Peter's given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So hold, hold on. Who ever heard of gates attacking anyone? You know, the gates of hell should not prevail because we're attacking them. And it, honestly, this comes down to like, who do you believe in? Who do you believe in? Is Jesus stronger or is the devil stronger? If Jesus is stronger, let's get on the offensive. Let's go. If the devil is stronger, then yeah, it's all defense. Oh no, oh no, he's he's too too big, too strong. I can't do anything. No, Jesus is bigger. Jesus is stronger. Jesus wins. We're with him. Let's go. We're on the offense. Right. Yeah. Now I still say we need to know what the devil's tactics are. And, you know, you mentioned the three uh, things that we can see without even going outside our door. Uh, you know, the love of nudity, the violence in society, and the schizophrenic mentality that pervades our culture. Um, that Those are signs to say, okay, um, that scripture passage about the demoniac, uh, when the Lord came and to, uh, and they pleaded, they say, oh, he hurts himself. He says, I'm legions. Um, oh, you know, all of these things. Yet the Lord came to solve that problem. But we also have to be mindful to say, ah, these are the signs of the demonic. And when we see these signs, we then have our um, counteraction. You know, uh, when we see nudity, we make reparation. And of course, we do our part to be modest and to cover up and stuff like that. Uh, and to, of course, instruct our children and our grandchildren. Uh, you know, when we see the violence, we know that's part of it. But then Jesus says in scripture, we're to do violence to ourselves, uh, to deny ourselves. And so that counteraction, and of course, the schizophrenic mentality, um, wow, you know, that's, that's so pervasive into this woke culture today. 
but for us then to preach wisdom and the word of God and to counteract that. But Father, uh, I know you wrote three chapters on these three items, but uh, share with us a little bit more insights on uh, these three signs of the demonic. Yeah, so back to how the devil is anti-creative. He yeah. doesn't have anything of his own. So so it's almost like it's not so much the devil is the father of lies. He's the father of half lies. He doesn't have his own thing to give you. He's got to take, take God's thing and twist it and pervert it. So that's, that's how we always need to look at the devil. He, he's tricky. I mean, in the Garden of Eden... Like he, what he says to Eve, he repeats God's words back to Eve, but they're a little different, but they're close enough. They confuse her. It's like, oh yeah, that sounds like what he said, but it's not exactly what he said. So same thing with these three signs. It's always a twist. So the first is love of nudity. And it is funny, honestly, when you go through these three signs, if you just read the titles of the three signs, you're like, huh, really? That's, that's what he picked as the main signs of the demonic. But as he explains them, it's like, okay, no, that makes all the sense in the world. So love of nudity. So this gets back to how uh, in the in the Garden of Eden, like they were naked and unashamed. Well, because they hadn't fallen yet, they were holy, there was no lust in their hearts. Okay, after the fall, they have to put on clothes because we objectify each other now. There's lust in our hearts. We We wish each other ill and whatnot. And Jesus will take us back to the Garden of Eden, but only through the cross. We have a lot of junk in our hearts. Got to get crucified. Okay. The devil says, oh, no, no, no cross. And you know what? Hey, I'll take you back to the Garden of Eden. And he will, but it'll be the demonic version of the Garden of Eden. The eroticism, the pornography that's pervading our culture so much today. It's a twist and objectification of human beings and whatnot. So again, he takes something good, he twists it and, and makes a demonic version of it, no cross, and he offers us that demonic version. And then I had a professor when I was at Ave Maria, my favorite professor, he used to say, you know, like you pull one string to the whole rug, but really, if you get human sexuality right, everything else tends to fall into place. If you get it wrong, look out. And even... I mean, what, the Protestants were against birth control for 400 years, and then they flipped the 1930s. And how many people tell us, oh, you know, why doesn't the church promote birth control? Because that'll get rid of abortion. But if you look at Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court ruling from, I think, 93, maybe 91, something like that, they said, oh, well, our, our culture is so based on birth control, but well, that doesn't always work, so we need abortion. The two go together. You pull one string, get the whole rug. You get human sexuality wrong, look out, and the devil attacks us there. That's the first sign of the demonic. And then the second sign is violence. So again, like it's a twist. Like there is a good form of violence. It's it's the crucifixion of our heart to be Christ-like. Um, earlier we were talking, you know, I'm a priest and victim, but like you were, you're a priest too. You were, when you were baptized, baptized priest, prophet, and king, so you're a victim too. So you got to let your hearts be crucified so that you can be Christ-like, just as I have to also. So there's a good form of violence. Fulton Sheen calls it the sword pointed inward. And then there's a bad form of violence. It's that demonic twist. It's the sword pointed outward. When we don't want to change ourselves, we'll try to change everything else. And it really gets, gets down to like, hey, are we made in the image and likeness of God? Like, if we are, that's amazing. Okay, well, then we have to let ourselves be made. That's a certain violence that has to be done to us to be Christ-like. When we don't accept that, when we don't want to change and be Christ-like, we'll try to change everything into our image after our likeness. And when people are crying in the streets, why doesn't the church change this? Why doesn't the church change that? Why? To match what? you believe in? Okay, you're doing violence to the church, violence to the teachings. You're doing violence to Christ to make it like you. That's the demonic. And then thirdly, schizophrenic mentality. Um, so it's interesting. Fulton Sheen, he calls it something different like every time. And some people have been mad at me. Like, are you saying schizophrenia is from the devil? And it's like, you know, it's demonic. I didn't know that that's not, not exactly what we're saying. Uh, however, it is interesting that uh, when it comes to demonic possession or a mental illness, the one they have the hardest time distinguishing between the two is schizophrenia and demonic possession. So that that's interesting right there. Um, but but it's not just schizophrenia, it's the loss of identity. The devil loves to attack our identity, God's identity, any identity. And our identity is, is in God, it's in Jesus. 
And when we lose that, when he pulls us away from Jesus, we're lost. We don't know who we are. So we go out in all directions trying to find who we are. It's interesting. So so to tie these together a little bit, um, we had we had someone protest in one of our churches. I think it was two years ago. It was a woman protesting for abortion. And during the homily, she stripped down, okay, nudity. She was promoting abortion. Okay, that's violent. And she said, I am Eve. Okay, Eve is the mother of all the living, and you're using that to promote abortion? Like, that's that's a confusion of identity. She had all three signs right there. The uh, LGBT++ movement, I mean, love of nudity, eroticism, perversion, that's like they define themselves that way so often. Violence, oh, when it comes to the drugs, the alcohol, the act itself, the domestic abuse, like, they, big time, big time. Loss of identity. Oh, you know, 150 genders or whatever they say nowadays, big time. All three signs of the demonic. Yeah, big time. Right. It, it just cries for reparation. It really does. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, you read the book and you say, okay, um, the evidence is very clear. It's the devil is here. He's busy. He's uh, wreaking havoc, uh, trying to bring as many souls to hell as he can. Uh, yet now, we have that opportunity to do our part. And uh, again, the three, um, uh, I guess, uh, tools that we can use, uh, they're just, they're tools that we've used for centuries, but somehow we forget. Um, again, I'm a plumber by trade, um, and yet I have amazing tools, and I have certain tools for certain jobs, but yet our blessed Lord has given us uh, these tools to uh, fight the demonic. And uh, again, they're at our disposal. Uh, and I think this is where we forget. And the devil wants us to forget that we have these great weapons, these great tools. He wants us to go on the defensive and just cower and, and not go on the offensive. But yet those three beautiful weapons that we can use, of course, the name of Jesus, uh, the blood of Jesus, and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, yes, they're at our disposal. And uh, I think it's almost like, you know, for those who go to the gym, you know, and exercise, they have to work on their muscles. They practice. It, it's repetition. And we have to have that same zeal to be repetitive to every day uh, call in the name of Jesus, to ask his precious blood to be uh, covering us and protecting us and fortifying us. And of course, relying on the Blessed Virgin Mary. But uh, in your role as a priest, oh, Father, uh, I'm sure these are remedies and uh, that you give to the faithful and, of course, encourage them to uh, take these weapons and use them uh, in their day-to-day -day activities. Oh, big time. So, so I mean, as you were saying, like, we, we, we can't forget. And, and you see that throughout the Old Testament, that's one of the main messages of the Lord is, don't forget. Like, let's go on the offensive. We, we, let's go. We got this. And, you know, God says, I am who am. He is. Like, let's go. So in a sense, the devil says, I am who am not. So it's not that the devil has to has to trick us or possess us. And there's so much he doesn't have to do. He just needs to distract us. Like, like really, from the devil's point of view, does it matter if you're a mile away from Jesus or a thousand miles away, so long as you're away, you know, so long as you're not on the offensive, so long as you're not using the weapons? So yeah, he, the devil loves to distract us, um, make us think the devil's a joke, you know, he, I am who am not type of a thing. So yeah, so Fulton Sheen, he gives us three, three main weapons. He gives us others too, but three main weapons. And the first is the name of Jesus. I, I love the practice. And I didn't really do this as a kid. I've, I've taken it up now. When someone says our Lord's name, like the little bow of the head, because with the name, like it comes the very presence of the person. Well, in this case, it's the person of Jesus, like that's a presence. That's a huge presence. And it's interesting. So when you look at the weapons, you know, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, Mary, the mother of God, the mother of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, the holy hour being you know, with Jesus, um, St. Joseph, the tear of demons, because he's got the power from Jesus. Our, our blessed mother was immaculately conceived because she was saved by Jesus beforehand. It's, it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And even in heaven, like St. Michael, the archangel by himself was not stronger than Lucifer. How, how is he stronger? 
because of God. He had God's power. So it really does all get back to God and specifically to Jesus. He's the one who comes to, to fight with the devil. And that's that's Fulton Sheen's main point in the chapter on the name of Jesus. It makes him present, but how? Like, if, like does Jesus just show up and just kind of sit there and like, hey, I'll just, you know, don't bother me too much? Like, no, like Jesus is a warrior. He he, he comes to fight the devil. And Fulton Sheen goes through the meaning of his name, um, you know, the, the Savior and, you know, from Joshua and whatnot. And uh, yeah, he comes to fight. So when we call upon him, it makes the presence of our Lord, it makes, him, it makes our Lord present and he's present to fight. He never stops fighting for us. The name of Jesus. The second weapon against the demonic is the blood of Jesus. And this is, this is honestly, this is one of the most beautiful chapters in the book, in my opinion. And this was taken from four or five uh, recorded talks and then in those recorded talks, he doesn't say much about the devil. So I went into his archives. I found two sets of handwritten notes for talks that I, I couldn't find the recordings of where he's specifically talking about defeating Satan through the blood of Christ. And then I, I spliced them all together to make one readable chapter. But it's a very beautiful chapter. And, and you can see this in secular society, like when, when girls cut What's going on? Well, they're trying to bleed something out. When young boys, young men, it's always young men, sadly, shoot up a school. Like they're trying, they're trying to bleed something out. Well, obviously, that's not the way, you know. So, so, and we see throughout the Old Testament, throughout history, really, that that people have always known somehow you you, you gotta bleed it out. You gotta bleed out sin. The Romans, who were pagans, they used to gore an ox and walk under the blood so the blood would drip on them, and they were hoping that would forgive their sins. In the Old Testament, the Israelites, they would have the scapegoat. They would kill one goat, sprinkle that blood on another goat, the scapegoat, and drive him out of town to try to get rid of their sins. And and this is all nice and, hey, great, great intention, but sin is really forgiven through the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus, and he sheds his blood for us on the cross. And that's what really breaks the hold of Satan. And Fulton Sheen, he has some, some beautiful pieces here. And he talks about, I'll try to find it, let's see here. Um, you know, he says, one could almost wish he were a sinner just in order to have a drop of that precious blood. It's, uh, you know, Moses sprinkled his people with the blood of the lamb, and at, at Mass, us priests sprinkle the people with the blood of the lamb, the blood of Jesus, which is so much more effective than the blood that Moses had at his disposal. But yeah, a, a very beautiful chapter. Um, yeah, devotion to the, the, the blood is, is, is great. Uh, I, I do, yeah, this, <laughs> people might get a little worked up here, but it is interesting with, um, communion. So many people want to drink from the chalice. I understand that. And when you read this chapter, you're really going to want to drink from the chalice, but you do get the body and the blood from the host all at the same time. Um, I go back and forth. As a priest, man, I've seen so many actions with the blood. So many people don't realize it's the blood. Hey, Father, when are we going to get the wine back? Oh, I just cringe. So part of me is like, hey, you know, maybe we should only have her for special occasions, for weddings and whatnot. Sometimes I go there. Other times, like, man, the, the blood is so important for fighting the devil. We need it at every mass. I, I go back and forth, but it's it's something to think about. And then the last sign of the demonic, or the third sign, not the last sign, the last weapon, third weapon against the demonic is Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. And this chapter is, is pulled from, it's mostly from the talk he gave in 1976 at the 41st International Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia, August of 76. So Fulton Sheen died three, well, three and three years and four months later in December of 1979. And, and so this is one of the last talks he ever gave. And it's about his favorite subject. Like, in my opinion, Fulton Sheen is at his best when talking about the cross. He prefers to talk about Our Lady. So we mentioned earlier the world's world's first love. That's actually Fulton Sheen's favorite book that he wrote, and Mary is his favorite subject. So this chapter, 1976, it really is like his condensed thought, all in one talk, all in one chapter, and with like 60 years to mature. So it's a very beautiful talk. 
very beautiful chapter. He talks about the tab, you know, our, our lady of the tabernacle, Jesus is the host. They're always together to profane Jesus. You got to break through the tabernacle first. You, you can't separate the two. And uh, you know, talks about the visitation and whatnot, the presentation, the swords to Our Lady, Our Our Lady of Sorrows, and then he talks about the demonic and Mary's hour. So we talked about the holy hour earlier. Mary has her hour too. In the Gospel of John, what's it to me and to you? Like my hour has not yet come. Well, Our Lady is with him in his hour. So Fulton Sheen even says it was in preparing for this particular talk in 1976 that he made some last connections between Our Lady and her fight against the devil. So yeah, she's there. She's alluded to in the book of Genesis. She's there in the Gospels. She's alluded to in the book of Revelation. She's always fighting for us, fighting for her children, always fighting the demonic. She's a great, great resource, a great weapon against the devil. And uh, yeah, one thing is say the rosary. So this is, this is, this is, I think this is very cool. At the end of the chapter, there were some handwritten notes from a notebook from Fulton Sheen from the 1970s. I couldn't quite decipher what it said. So I took a picture of those handwritten notes and it's in the book. Hopefully you can decipher it. But the first thing is say the rosary. The second thing is have a statue of Our Lady. And the third thing, I don't know. That's what I couldn't decipher. But the picture of his handwritings in the book, maybe you could too. Wow, that is amazing. But, you know, I, as I listen to you, Father, I think of the precious blood. And I think of the one um, line from a book that um, Sheen talked about. Uh, he talked about confession. And he talked about how, you know, when the penitent en enters the confessional, of course, he's meeting the priest in Personae Christi. But when the priest raises his hand to give absolution, it's almost as the uh, drops of blood are coming off the priest's hands as he makes the sign of the cross to absolve uh, the penitent of their sins. And so, again, the the beauty of the confessional and that, you know, we think of when we go and receive the Eucharist, we're receiving uh, Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. Yet when we go to confession, uh, the uh, drops of blood that come from the hand of the priest to absolve us of our sins, uh, to cleanse us. Um, again, we don't take confession seriously as we should. I think uh, we try to go to Mass as often as we can, but we kind of lag about how many times we go to confession a year. But if we knew that the blood of Jesus was waiting for us uh, in the confessional uh, when the priest absolves us, uh, we might go a little bit more often. So yeah. just oh, and, yeah. And he talks about that, about all the sacraments are, are from the blood. But he's got that beautiful visual um, about going to confession, the, the blood dripping from the priest's hands. And and it's it's interesting. So Billy Graham, I read his autobiography, great guy. And uh, but but I mean he's he's not Catholic he doesn't have all seven sacraments mm -hmm. so he once gave a beautiful talk on the blood of Christ and his his apex is conclusion okay so now like let's imagine and that's that's it like we we have the holy sacrifice of the mass we can receive the blood we have confession we can have that blood wash over our souls like that that blood that blood is is uh, available to us as Catholics. It's available to us through the sacraments. It's there. We got it. It's just not in our imagination. It's there. Right. Yeah. I think of, um, you know, one passage in your book that really struck me. Um, it, it was in, you know, the foreword. Uh, you talked about a comedian and how a comedian has one good joke and it sometimes takes him 10, 15, 20 years to perfect that joke. Uh, but yet priests have one sermon that they preach and perfect. And you mentioned that Sheen's one sermon was on the cross, and yet he perfected that sermon over his 60 years of priestly ministry. And again, the preaching of the cross, the power of the cross. And I think of how Fulton Sheen uh, challenged uh, his listeners uh, and, of course, his readers by uh, inviting them to have a crucifix on their desk to carry a crucifix in their pocket, uh, to put the crucifix in a prominent place and spend time. Uh, I think of the pictures of the saints, and, and many of us have those pictures throughout our home. What is the saint holding? A crucifix, looking upon the crucifix tenderly and realizing that their sin had something to do with the crucifixion of the Lord 
and yet our Lord loves us and lays down his life for us. But put the crucifix in your life, the cross. And, you know, I think this is something we can uh, possibly just wind up our interview on is, again, the theme of the cross and the power of the cross, but again, the need for the cross in our life and how uh, it really is the one object that the devil fears. Because when we look upon a crucifix and the Satan looks upon the crucifix, it's a reminder of his greatest defeat. Uh, his greatest defeat. That's when he was defeated, uh, the power of the cross. And so that's why we need to bring the crucifix back. Um, Fulton Sheen talks about how uh, religious sisters handed in their crucifixes uh, to a jeweler. And uh, the jeweler said, what's wrong with your church? You know, And yet Fulton Sheen was using that as example to say, don't be like those religious sisters years ago. Put the crucifix back in your life. The schools have taken them down, uh, offices, uh, public places, taken them down. We need to put them back up uh, and put the crucifix back in our life, but put the cross in our conversations. And I think that's what I find with Fulton Sheen's writings. He always brings us back to the cross. Uh, always who's there at the foot of the cross. Our Lady, St. John, Magdalene, again, all redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So the saints need... are always at the foot of the cross. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So let's talk a little bit about the cross. And um, again, I think it's a nice uh, way to um, wind up our conversation because um, again, we begin with the cross. We end with the cross. I think of sometimes when we go to Holy Mass, we begin with the sign of the cross. We end with the sign of the cross, but it's all about the cross. So uh, I'll leave that to you, Father Dave. Okay. So if we go way back, you mentioned the comedian and, you know, the priest has one sermon. So I haven't told anyone this, at least not in an interview. The comedian is uh, my favorite comedian, Emo Phillips. He was big in the 80s. He's weird. If you look him up, you're going to go, wow, does Father Tom Mazzucchi you know how weird he is? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But he's very clever. And then the priest I'm mentioning is actually Father John Ricardo. And so I was with Father John, my, my, my first assignment as a priest, my first uh, main parish as a priest. And his favorite comedian is also Emo Phillips. We had that in common. But it was it was amazing being with Father John in those years. I was with him uh, 2017 to 2019, two full years. And especially his last year, he really got into what became the Rescued Project. So at that time, he was, what, 56 years old. And you just really saw him like coming into his own with that, with the Rescued Project, which is now his one sermon and he's been working on it for years and doing tons of good with that sermon. So, so he used to say, you know, yeah, every priest has one sermon. And I was with them when he, in my mind, really discovered his one sermon and he's run with it. And he's he's doing great work. Okay, so, but to get to the cross, yeah. So, so way in the introduction, Fulton Sheen talks about the lack of discipline, the last lack of the cross in our lives. He calls it starophobia, you know, starro from uh, from cross in Greek, phobia for fear, fear of the cross. He's he's making jokes in Greek because Fulton Sheen is a big nerd and he can do that. Um, but it's very true. It's very true. So he's saying, like, who has discipline? The military academies, the football fields. That's really about it. They're the only ones who who really discipline themselves, carry a cross. And that's that's very dangerous. And and Al, even what you said about about uh, you know taking the cross down, like the cross is the victory. The crucifix is the victory of Christ over Satan. Hey, let's let's just forget about that victory. And in doing so, we forget about Jesus and we forget about Satan, which gets back to God says, "I am who am." The devil says, "I am who am." Not nah, just forget about me, you know. So uh, the cross, in the end, like yeah, the cross is everything. And, and it's interesting. Fulton Sheen says, how, okay, yes, the resurrection is everything, but you don't get a choice in the resurrection. If you pick up the cross, then you follow Jesus and you will rise. If you don't pick up the cross, then you don't. So your choice is in the cross. And ultimately, it's about humility. Like the devil has no humility. He will not suffer. When our Lord said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Like Satan would never get behind Jesus. But Peter did. Like, yeah, Peter Peter did something wrong. He tempted our Lord from the cross. Peter did a lot of wrong things, but he was humble. He always got behind Jesus. So, yeah, uh, th th there's a whole chapter in here. Most of the chapter is taken from an article from 1969 from the Courier Journal, the um, the Rochester Dawson paper. But uh, there's a few other little pieces. And at the end, 
our uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, he gives he gives a beautiful reflection that comes from some talks. Do I have any scars? You know, our Lord's hands were scarred. His feet were scarred with the nails. His side was scarred with the lance, pierced with the lance. And he says, you know, show me your hands. Have, have, have they been scarred from giving? Are they scarred in service? Show me your feet. Have they gone on missions? Have they helped missionaries? Have they gone about doing good? Have they often made a track down the middle aisle of a church to visit the Eucharistic Savior? Have they ever wandered in front of the feet of the crucifix? Show me your side. Is it scarred in pain out of love for him, love for Jesus, scarred, the heart scarred in love, not a need love, a greedy need, I need love, but scarred in gift love. He says, this is the way we'll be judged, hands and feet and side. And then he tells this beautiful little story, and this brings a tear to my eye. I'll try not to get choked up. But he says, a little girl said to her mother one day, Mommy, how did your hands get that way? How did they get so ugly? Oh, my dear child, when you were a little baby, the house caught fire, and I thought of only one thing. I ran upstairs, and your cradle was aflame. I threw off all the blankets, and I pulled you out from the fire that blazed about my feet, my face and my hands, and I saved your life. That's why my hands are that way. Oh, the girl said, Mommy, I love your scars. So Fulton Sheen says how in an old legend, it is said that Satan appeared to a saint and said, I am the Christ. And the saint confounded him by asking, where are the marks of nails? And he says, Satan may appear in many disguises like Christ, try to look like Christ. And at the end of the world will appear as a benefactor, philanthropist, do nice things. But Satan never has and never will appear with scars. And the chapter ends, we perhaps are too hard on St. Thomas. Actually, what he was saying was that the only Redeemer that he would believe was one who would have scars on his hands and feet and side. It was only a scarred Christ that won a doubting Thomas, and it will only be a scarred Christ that will save a doubting church. And that's so true. So presenting Jesus as scarred because he is, but then ourselves, it's... um. It's been interesting doing these interviews. So this is this is about my 30th interview. I've lost count. And most have been very good. My, this, this one's been very good. Thanks, Al. It's been very good. But it's been interesting when we talk about the demonic, how many people say, oh, like those people over there. Oh, they can point them out in a heartbeat. And a lot of these people, I'll, I'll just say it, 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 most of the interviews that I've done have been on more conservative places. So the liberals tend not to believe in the demonic, so they don't invite me to do interviews. The conservatives do, but the conservatives believe that, oh, it's the liberals who are demonic. We don't have anything to fear, you know. And these same shows so often hate on the Pope, you know, bad mouth the Pope. And if you look at this book that Fulton Sheen wrote that I put together, one of the smaller signs of the demonic is bashing the Pope. He calls it the anti-hero. It's right in there. But it's amazing how quickly people can point out the demonic in others, but not in me. That's a lack of humility. That's an aversion to the cross. The devil's working on each and every one of us. We have to have the humility to admit it and then root it out and give it to the Lord. Yes, amen. And of course, Fulton Sheen was so faithful to the popes over the years, so was friends with the popes, and uh, invited us to pray for the pope, pray for the Holy Father. He would, if he was alive today, he'd still be saying, let's pray for the Holy Father. Let's do that. So, uh, you know, I, I think of, you know, how you were sharing so beautifully about the cross. Um, again, people always say to me, well, do you know when the Antichrist is coming? And we hear Antichrist all the time. And yet, Fulton Sheen would just say, you know, in a nutshell, Antichrist is anti-cross. Whenever anyone's saying, turn away from the cross, go against uh, what the church has always believed and presented, again, they're anti-cross. So again, if the cross is presented as a, a sign of power and redemption and victory, there, you're on the right side. But when they steer you away from the cross, Again, antichrist equals anti-cross. So uh, there's your easy way to figure it out. That's for sure. Amen. Very good. Yeah. All right, Father. Of course, uh, the book is available uh, on Amazon. Uh, again, it's the book on the demonic, uh, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, compiled and edited by Father Dave Tomasicki. 
And uh, again, I invite everyone to visit the St. Paul Center. Uh, for There's many great resources there. And uh, their website is uh, stpaulcenter.com. Now, St. is S-T. Uh, some people, when they're doing these um, Google searches or typing into the internet, uh, remember that St. Paul Center is S-T, then paulcenter.com. Uh, you can do forward slash sheen, and it will take you right to the book uh, page. But as you said earlier, Father, uh, we're working on the global distribution together. And mm -hmm. these, these, mm -hmm. these things take time. Uh, but again, please remember your seminarians, your priests, your friends, your families. Everyone needs this book in their own personal library. Yes, by Life of Christ buy the world's first love. Um, you'll see many of the uh, books available for sale on our website, bishopsheentoday.com. Uh, of course, I've been blessed to compile and edit uh, three dozen books over the years of Fulton Sheen, so I understand uh, Father Dave Tomasecki's uh, journey of uh, editing and compile, but again, Sheen has so many um, great ideas and stories. And of course, it's a labor of love for Fulton Sheen. He was always tending to souls. Uh, again, I said earlier, unless souls are saved, nothing is saved. And this is about saving souls. So we need these writings in our life to understand this is the spiritual battle. We're battling the demonic. We need to make reparation. We need to call in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and to shoulder up with our Blessed Mother, Our Lady, to have her, um, again, that beautiful gift at the cross when our Lord said, behold your mother. And, uh, of course, St. John took her into his home, uh, received the blessing of living with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, again, we need to take her into our lives, too. And so, uh, again, go to Mary, and she'll, of course, bring us to Jesus. So, uh, again, Father, thank you for writing the book, and thank you for your priestly ministry. And, uh, again, uh, God love you for that. And so if you could uh, end the uh, our little podcast today, our little segment uh, in prayer, we appreciate that very much. Definitely, definitely. So uh, one quick thing. So in the acknowledgments, I should have mentioned you, Al. Uh, so you were a big help in trying to figure out just who owns these things, what's public domain, what do you got to get copyrights for? And I acknowledge a lot of people, but I forgot to acknowledge you. So thank you very much for your help as we talked over the months and years as this uh, project was underway. Yeah. But uh, let's let's pray. <laughs> let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We, we, we ask for your love, Lord, your presence to drive away the devil, that we always may be focused on you, all for the salvation of souls, the souls whom you love so much, who you love to the point of death. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I thank you, Father Dave Tomasecki, uh, for all of your contributions to the church and, of course, uh, joining the mission of uh, being not just priest and victim, but, uh, again, an ambassador for Christ. And so thank you very much for that. My dear friends, you are listening to Bishop Sheen Presents here on the Bishop Sheen Today Media Network. <laughs>